Hello everyone and welcome to part two of the Winecast on Champagne. For the sake of celebrating the holidays with family and friends, like I hope you were doing, I cut the last cast a bit short, taking us through a little bit of the history of how Champagne went from being a region making still wine, like most of the world's wine regions, to a part of the wine world famous for its bubbles and for its method of getting those bubbles in the bottle. There's still much more history to cover, but let's save that for another cast. Now let's have a look at some of the features that make Champagne different from other regions that also use the traditional method. Like most French wine regions, AOC Champagne, the only AOC for sparkling wine in the region, regulates the grapes that can be used to produce its wine, and while many people know about the three major grapes permitted for the region, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier, most don't know that four additional grapes are also permitted, Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, Petit Meslier, and Arban. It's rare to see a champagne made using any of the minor grapes at all, let alone all seven permitted grapes, but it does happen with the most famous example probably being Le Nombre d'Or, or the Golden Number by the House of Aubrey. This particular wine not only uses the minor four, but often foregrounds some of those grapes like Pinot Gris and Petit Meslier as the main ingredients in the blend. So it's definitely worth checking out if you're able. Though the minor four are making a bit of a comeback because of the diversity they represent, both genetic and cultural, combined they still make up less than 1% of total acres planted to grapes in Champagne, with the rest of the acreage split in rough thirds between the three major grapes, with Pinot Noir having the most acres planted, followed by Meunier and Chard. So, almost all Champagne just involves Chardonnay and or the two reds, Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier with the huge majority of that being a blend of at least two of those three grapes. If a champagne is made only from red grapes, either Pinot Noir, or Pinot Meunier, or both, it will be designated as a Blanc de Noir, that is, a white wine from black grapes, because champagne is vinified or made into wine as a white wine, even if made from red grapes. And champagne made from only white grapes, including the minor grapes, is designated as a Blanc de Blanc, or white from white. Though, in the overwhelming majority of cases, a Blanc de Blanc will be 100% Chardonnay. Rosé Chardonnay is a thing, and it's usually made by adding a little red wine made from one of the Pinots when topping off after disgorging. It is possible to let one of the cuvées or batches of wine blended into the final champagne become pink from skin contact during the first fermentation, but there's a risk that pigments acquired that way may turn an unappetizing brown color later in the process, so blending in some red remains the most popular option. Champagne is divided into five key winemaking districts or subregions. Four of them are clustered around the city of Epernay, and another city whose name, though it looks to English speakers like it should be pronounced Reims or Rems, the French actually pronounce something like Reims, more or less. Epernay and Reims are the two major commercial and cultural centers for the region, but there's also an increasingly important region to the south called the Aube, with a wine district known as the Côte de Bar. In the north, Montagne de Reims is planted to Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. The Vallée de la Marne is where most of the region's Pinot Meunier comes from, as well as some Pinot Noir. The Côte de Blanc and the Côte de Cézanne are planted heavily to Chardonnay, and to the south, the Côte de Bar is very much about Pinot Noir. You won't necessarily see these regions on labels because most houses pull grapes from all over the greater Champagne region when making their wines but the names may come up in discussions of wines made by smaller producers deliberately sourcing their grapes from a small area. Most champagne is non-vintage and is made from a blend of the wine from the year it was produced and wine held back from previous years, called a reserve. Not just any wine is held back though, but only wine from a year when a house, as producers in champagne are known, called a vintage and made a wine exclusively from grapes grown that year. By law, houses that call a vintage have to reserve a portion of that vintage's wine, around 20%, for use in future non-vintage years. The theory is that holding back some of the good stuff and using it to goose up blends in years when Champagne's notoriously bad weather results in poor grapes and less than optimal wine will help a house to produce a wine in a more or less consistent style from year to year. In bad years, some houses will 
use only wine from that year, but still label it a non-vintage wine so that they won't have to save any of the wine made that year for future vintages, since it wasn't very good, and so that they won't have to blend in good reserve from previous years to try and save a wine that doesn't have a whole lot going for it to begin with. Houses usually only call vintages and make vintage wine in years that they consider good, which, practically speaking, means that it was a relatively warm year with mild weather that helped the grapes get ripe without damage from the elements. Historically, most houses have called vintages about three or four times a decade, but thanks at least in part to global climate change, warmer and milder years are getting more common in Champagne, and you're seeing more and more vintages being called. There is a classification system for grapes from Champagne called the Echelle de Cru, or ladder or scale of growths, but it doesn't classify individual vineyards like Burgundy or houses like Bordeaux. Instead, it classifies the villages where grapes are grown on a scale of 80 to 100, with villages scoring a perfect 100 called Grand Cru villages, and villages scoring 90 to 99 Premier Cru villages. Scores of 80 to 89 have no classification. If a champagne is made entirely from grapes that came from either Grand Cru or Premier Cru villages, it can use those designations on its label. But that's relatively rare since even in vintage years, blending from multiple villages and subregions of champagne is the norm. The system originated as a way to allow villages to set prices for their grapes based on their reputation for producing quality fruit. But it's had its fair share of criticism for not being particularly interested in the different terroirs that could be contained within a village municipality. Currently, there are 17 Grand Cru villages and 44 Premier Cru villages in Champagne. Sweetness is regulated in Champagne, and the terms used there have been adopted by other regions that make traditional method sparklers. Though Perrier Jouet's experiment with a truly dry Champagne got some pushback at first, Brutes are by far the biggest sellers in modern Champagne. Sweet champagnes are still a thing, but the very sweetest category, Douce, is getting harder to find as tastes and sparkling wines drift toward the less sweet end of things. Unless you really put some effort into looking, the sweetest champagne you're likely to find anymore is going to be a demi-sec. That will still come across as pretty sweet. Though tastes are tending toward brute, that category does carry a fair amount of sugar, sometimes around 1.2%, which in most still wines would come off as decidedly off-dry, but thanks to the high acid in champagnes, this relatively small amount of sweetness just rounds out the acid and still comes off tasting dry. If you're curious about what a champagne with virtually no sugar tastes like, you can check out a Brut Nature, which as the alternate names Brut Sauvage, Sans Dosage, and Dosage Zero suggest, received no additional sweetness when topped off. These are harder to find than brutes, but significantly more common than deuce, and they'll give you a sense of the acid that champagnes are really known for. You should note that even though these terms are regulated, the EU allows a margin of plus or minus 0.3% sugar. So a brute, for example, could end up with as much as 1.5% sugar, which, even with good acid, would be detectable as sweet. According to Champagne's official website, and yes, there is such a thing, Champagne.France, there are 306 houses that produce Champagne, but they get their grapes from around 15,800 growers, so relatively little of the total acreage of Champagne is owned by the big production houses, who instead buy grapes from all over and make a large volume of wine that way. Making a traditional method sparkler is a technical and expensive process, and traditionally, growers haven't had the means to do it, but more and more, currently around 4,400, are trying their hand at producing what's called grower champagne, which is just champagne made by the same individuals who grew the grapes. Identified on the bottle in tiny script with the letters RM that stand for Recoltant Manipulant, or roughly Harvester Producer, these wines have been praised for their ability to express terroir, because unlike the gigantic cuvées of the big houses sourced from all over the region, the grapes in these wines all came from areas of homogenous terroir. But, as always, there's a catch. In bad years, growers don't have access to grapes from different areas to help cover weaknesses in their grapes, nor do they usually have access to large reserves to create a consistent style from year to year. So when buying grower champagne, which you totally should, Pay attention to vintage. 
Apart from RM, you'll see other letters on bottles that indicate whether or not the wine was made by a cooperative of growers and other things. But the most important pair of letters to note is NM, or Négociant Manipulant, or Buyer Producer. That, that means that this wine was produced by someone who bought rather than grew the grapes. You can find this on wines produced by the big houses who buy most of their grapes, but many of the houses own some land and will often make a special bottling of champagne exclusively from grapes grown on land they own. So the big houses can make grower champagne too, and you'll spot it by the RM that appears on those labels as well. Speaking of labels, while Champagne AOC is the only AOC that covers sparkling wine in the region, there are two additional AOCs. Rosé de Risse, which makes rosé from Pinot Noir, and Coteau Champenois for still wines made from local grapes, which are usually non-vintage for the same reasons that their sparkling cousins are. Both of these other wines are hard to find outside of France. There's also no IGP quality tier for this region, so you either meet the requirements for AOC or it's Vin de France for you. So where does all this bubbly go? Well, according to our friends at Champagne.France, of the 312 million bottles that were shipped from the region in 2015, a little over half, around 161 million bottles, stayed in France, while a little under half were exported. Fittingly, given its historical infatuation with the bubbles, the United Kingdom was the top destination for that wine, taking in about 34 million bottles in 2015 and leading the next biggest export market, the U.S., by almost 14 million bottles. Which is pretty remarkable when you consider the relative sizes of both of these countries. The U.S. is followed by Germany and Japan, taking up the three and four spots, and pretty close to each other in terms of exports received, with Belgium, Australia, Italy, Switzerland, Spain, and Sweden rounding out the top ten. Still, despite all this bubbly, Champagne is responsible for only about one twelfth or around 8% of total world production of sparkling wine. This cast is coming out just in advance of New Year's 2017. There should be a fair number of corks popping right around that time, so I thought I'd end with a few thoughts on how to best spend your Champagne budget. There's a ton of great Champagne out there, but if you want to take an opportunity to expand your palate a little bit, make an effort to try some varietal Champagne. Either a Blanc de Blanc, which will almost always be 100% Chardonnay, or a Blanc de Noir, which could be a blend of Pinot Noir and Meunier, but try to find one that's 100% of either varietal. One of the best tastings of my life involved trying three champagnes, each made from one of the three major grapes, and after tasting that, I really got a sense for what each of these grapes brings to the table when it's blended. The Chard was clean and pure and all about apples and minerals, while the Pinots were bringing interesting fruit notes to the party, with the Noir playing coy and the Meunier getting a little more in my face. It's really worth getting to know these grapes and the wines that they can make on their own. The big houses make great wine, but there really is something to all the buzz about grower champagne. It can really be interesting and complex, but make sure that you do some research to solicit the opinions of someone in the know, because it can be hit or miss with these and do pay attention to vintages and reviews. These champagnes will sing in good years, but they can be dicier in the not-so-good years. Lastly, some words of warning or friendly advice. First, there's a lot of inexpensive champagne out there, and a lot of it isn't all that wonderful. I know everyone dreams about that truly remarkable bottle of $10 champagne that drinks up there with the heavy hitters, and God bless you if you can find it, but it's done a great job of eluding me. Champagne is one of those wines where there tends to be a correlation between price and quality. Spending more won't necessarily get you a good bottle, but you're unlikely to get a good bottle unless you spend a little more. Second, if you have some non-vintage champagne sitting in the fridge waiting for a special occasion, and it's been there a while, pause this cast, pop it, and celebrate. And if you can't think of anything to celebrate, just open a bag of potato chips to drink with it. It goes great with that. Get something fresh for New Year's or any special occasion because non-vintage stuff really doesn't age. Finally, if you see something labeled California Champagne or labeled Champagne with any other geographic indication, it's not Champagne. Though in 2006, the U.S. agreed to no longer approve any new wine labels with the name Champagne on them, it allows wineries that had that term approved for labels prior to that year to continue labeling their wines as Champagne, provided they use a geographic designation like California or New York or whatever. 
In addition to not being champagne, there's no guarantee that the wine is even made from the traditional method. So, not to beat a dead yeast cell, whatever virtues these wines may have, being champagne isn't one of them. Thanks again for joining me for another wine cast. My New Year's resolution is to keep making more and more of these casts, and I'd love a little help from you, my listeners, in the form of suggestions for topics. Please, don't just wait around for me to stumble on what you really wanted to hear about, but let me know where your interests are, and I'll try to get right on it for you. Here's wishing all of you a happy and prosperous New Year, and I hope you ring it in happily and safely. I'm your host, the Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.